Well, our scripture reading for today, to which I invite you to turn with me at this time, is found in the Old Testament book of Psalms, Psalm 93. Psalm 93. If you are using one of our Maroon Bibles, this can be found on page 513, page 513 in the Maroon Bible. Psalm 93. Psalm 93, we read those five verses, which will constitute our text for today. And I gleaned my sermon title from those first three words in verse 1, The Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. Psalm 93, let us hear then the word of the living God. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. Indeed, the world is established, firm and secure. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. The seas have lifted up, Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves. Mightier than the thunder of the great waters. Mightier than the breakers of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Your statutes, Lord, stand firm. Holiness adorns your house for endless days. Thus far the reading of God's holy word. And as always, dear friends, I ask and urge you to keep your Bibles open and handy as we look to God's word together on this Lord's Day morning. <clears throat> dear congregation of Jesus Christ, even as we have gathered here today in this place in relative peace and comfort. As we mentioned in the pastoral prayer a moment ago, war is raging between Israel and Hamas. War also continues to rage, does it not, between Ukraine and Russia in Eastern Europe. And here on the home front, we seem to be facing political paralysis in Washington, D.C. and economic uncertainty throughout the land. And when we add to all of this, all of our own personal sorrows and sufferings, all of the personal or interpersonal or physical or mental or emotional issues, burdens, that you and I may have to bear each and every day. Is it any wonder that many people throughout the USA and indeed throughout the entire world may tend to discouragement, may tend to despondency, if not out and out despair? And friends, with all love and respect, some of us may be feeling that way in the deepest recesses of our hearts and minds even as we're here in worship today. Ah, but notice, but notice. Be that as it may, as we turn to the words of our scripture reading, as recorded for us in Psalm 93, we find that we are being given renewed reasons for a restored hope and courage and confidence and comfort. And brothers and sisters, the reason is, is because the psalmist reminds us that no matter what trials or tribulations we are personally going through today, no matter what tumult or turmoil the nations of the world may be going through today, the psalmist reminds us that all of God's people, that is, all those who by God's sovereign grace and electing love have repented of their sins and professed faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, each and every day, right on to eternity, can rest and rejoice in the reality of the fact, listen, that the Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. The Lord Almighty reigns. Now then, as we work our way through this relatively brief psalm together, Psalm 93, we're going to notice three key reasons as to why the fact that the Lord reigns ought to bring us such incredible comfort, courage, and confidence. Reason number one, our text teaches us, is because of the clothing of His reign. The clothing of His reign. 
Look at verse 1 of Psalm 93 with me, if you would, please. It says, the Lord reigns. The Hebrew says, Yahweh Malach. Yahweh Malach. Yahweh is the Hebrew name for Lord. Notice the four capital letters. That is the name by which God introduced himself to Abraham, excuse me, Moses at the burning bush. It means that he is the great I am. He is the eternal one, the self-existent one. He needs no one and nothing. Interestingly enough, for all the several names used of God uh, by which he reveals himself in the scriptures, only Yahweh, only the Lord is used here in Psalm 93. That's the only name by which he reveals himself in Psalm 93. And he uses it five times in just these five verses. Yahweh Malak. Now stay with me. In, in Hebrew, the name Melek, M-E-L-E-K, is if, if you're taking notes, means king. Malak is the verb form of the noun Melek. And so Yahweh Malak means that he, he reigns, he rules with sovereign power and sovereign authority. Yahweh Malak. The Lord reigns, notice. He is robed. Some of the translations also translate the word clothed. The Lord reigns, he is robed or clothed in majesty. And then using what uh, grammarians call Hebrew parallelism, he uses the same wording in a repetitious fashion in order to make and emphasize a particular point. The Lord reigns, he is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. Now friends, if you were to give a layman's thumbnail definition of the term majesty, How would you describe it? How would you define the term majesty? Well, it's actually a bit of a difficult term to describe. Webster's Dictionary defines majesty as sovereign power, authority, or dignity, grandeur, greatness, or splendor of quality or character, end of quote. The great preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon writes this. Listen carefully, please. He says, God is not simply clothed with the emblems of majesty, but with majesty itself. Everything which surrounds him is majestic. Now, friends, there's many different passages in Scripture which reveal the majesty of God. But one of my favorites, and I think the most powerful, perhaps, is found in Isaiah chapter 6. If you would care to turn with me, go to the right several pages till you come to the major prophecy of Isaiah In the Maroon Bible, it's page 590, page 590, Isaiah chapter 6. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. Now think of this in relation to the majesty of God. Isaiah 6, verse 1. Isaiah writes, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Above Him were seraphim, each with six wings. Boys and girls, pictures this. These angels, with two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, the God of armies. The whole earth is full of His glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Now, friends, think about that, the majesty of God. That is a brief glimpse into the person and the majesty of the God with whom we have to do. And the God to whom each and every man, woman, and child who ever lived will one day have to give an account. And that includes each of us here in worship, myself obviously included, It includes the Hamas terrorists who slew over 100 Israeli citizens and took over 100 of them captive. It includes the Hamas terrorists who who killed some 27, is that the latest number, of Americans and took uh, some 14 Americans hostage as well. He is the God to whom each and every man, woman, and child who ever lived will one day have to give an account. But friends, not only so, let's go back to verse 1 of Psalm 93. Look with me, please. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty, and notice, and armed, or some of the translations say, and girded with strength. Girded with strength. Now, the Hebrew conveys a sense of omnipotence in that language. It is unlimited power. It is, uh, it is uh, irresistible strength. He can do whatever He pleases. In fact, if you're taking notes, we're not going to turn to these verses, but in Job 42, verse 2, Job 42, verse 2, the sorely suffering Job says to the Lord, 
I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. In Psalm 115, verse 3, the psalmist says, Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases Him. And finally on this score, in Isaiah 43, verse 13, God Himself declares, No one can deliver out of my hand when I act, who can reverse it? When I act, who can reverse it? The omnipotence of the Lord our God. Now, boys and girls, when I was your age, I used to uh, like to listen to uh, Sunday school songs and uh, gospel songs, and I had to do that generally uh, on records. But uh, technology improved through the years, and when we had children, they didn't have to listen to records. Uh, they could listen to the latest version of uh, technology, cassette tapes. Now, boys and girls, you may never have seen one of these, but when our, when our children were young, uh, Mrs. Kukin would play uh, gospel songs for our children, uh, either on a cassette player, and not you, you could do that over your mother's phone probably, but she would play a cassette player or in the car. We would play cassette tapes of uh, gospel songs, Christian music. And one of the songs our children love the most, I'm not going to sing it to you, so don't worry, but the words began like this. Maybe you've heard the song, boys and girls. The song goes like this. My God is so great, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so great, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. And then sometimes they would yell, it's true, it's true. Well, my young friends, this is what is being conveyed in verse 1. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. The great reformer John Calvin puts it this way, and I quote, The planets, in all their wanderings, maintain their respective positions. How could the earth hang suspended in the air were it not upheld by God's hand? End of quote. And that's true. And what, what this text is telling us, in the words of one commentator, is God is not simply our cosmic creator. He is also the world's sovereign sustainer. And I'm going to read that again. God is not simply our cosmic creator. He is also the world's sovereign sustainer. In other words, God is not the God of deism. The deists say God created the world, and then he just set it off like a spinning top and had no more dealings with it. That is not what the Bible teaches. God is not an absentee landlord. He is intimately involved in the creation He made and in the people He created in His image. And He does it through His Son. In fact, if you would care to turn with me, let's go to the New Testament, the book of Colossians. If you want to just listen to our cross-referencing, that's fine. But in Colossians 1, Maroon Bible, page 1015, 1015, Colossians 1, verses 15 through 17, note these words of the Holy Spirit-inspired Apostle Paul. The Son, that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. That is a title of majesty. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, notice, and in Him, that is in Jesus Christ, all things hold together. Similarly, if you're turning with me, let's go to the book of Hebrews, the first chapter. Hebrews chapter 1, page, let me see if I wrote it down. Uh, who's got the page in the, in the Maroon Bible? 3, 1033? Ah, oh, beautiful, 1033. Okay, Hebrews 1, page 1033. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, and through whom also He made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being, notice, sustaining all things by His powerful Word. Let's go back to, with that in mind, let's go back to Psalm 93 together. Psalm 93, back to the words of our text. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength, and armed with strength. Indeed, the world is established firm and secure. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. In Hebrews 13, verse 8, we read, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. 
and that eternal God is clothed in majesty. He is armed with might. He will do whatever He pleases. And friends, that is why when we consider this theme that is set forth in verse 1, the Lord reigns. We should be incredibly comforted in spite of what the world is going through, in spite of what you and I are going through, and it is because of His clothing. It is because of the clothing of His reign. Well, as our text continues, we find a second reason as to why all of God's people ought to be incredibly comforted uh, by the fact that the Lord reigns, and that is because of the character of His reign, because of the character of His reign. Uh, let's pick it up now in verse uh, 3. Look with me, please, at verse 3. The seas, or the floods, have lifted up, Lord, Yahweh. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves. Now, how many of us have ever been to the ocean? I have friends in the Midwest that have never seen the ocean. Have we all seen the ocean? Everybody, just put your hand up real quick. Everybody seen the ocean? Okay, 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 I think about everybody. Have you ever noticed on a stormy day the power of the waves? The power of the waves. We were down at Stone Harbor this, uh, this summer just for a week in New Jersey. And uh, they had to do this huge sand replenishing, honey, is that what it was called? They had these huge pipes and everything. They had to replenish the sand that was washed off the beach by the pounding of the waves over the last several months. And many times, brothers and sisters, when you read about the seas or the waves or the pounding of the waves in the Scripture, it, it is and can be referring physically to the power of the storms. Noah's flood, for example, a literal, physical, historical reality. But also many times when you read of the seas or the, the, the waves in the Scripture, it needs to be interpreted allegorically or figuratively. And you need to look at the context to determine which way you are supposed to uh, interpret that specific language. And so, for example, for allegorical figurative interpretation, uh, let's go to Psalm 65. Just go back to the left several pages if you're turning with me. Psalm 65, and look with me, please, at verses 5 through 7. Psalm 65, verses 5 through 7. The psalmist David says, You answer us with awesome and righteous deeds, God our Savior, the hope of all the ends of the earth, and of the farthest seas, who form the mountains by your power, having armed yourself with strength. You stilled the roaring of the seas, the roaring of the waves, and here's that poetic parallelism, and the turmoil of the nations. You see, the turmoil of the nations is being likened to the restlessness or the roaring of the seas. That's also true in Psalm 46, by the way. But let's go to the book of Isaiah. Let's go back to Isaiah. We were in chapter 6 before. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8, page 592, page 592 in the Maroon Bible. F a figurative allegorical language concerning the waves and the seas, their, their tumult. Isaiah 8, look with me please at verses 5 through 8, page 592. Isaiah says, The Lord spoke to me again, because this people, that is the people of Judah, has rejected the gently flowing waters of Shiloh. What are the gently flowing waters of Shiloh? Well, I've got a footnote in my study Bible that says, refer, the waters of Shiloh refer to the water in Jerusalem that flows from the Gihon Spring to the pool of Siloam. Here, it symbolizes the, the sustaining power of the Lord. You see the figure, the, the allegory. Because this people, Judah, has rejected the gently flowing waters of Shiloh, the sovereign care of the Lord our God, and rejoices over Rezin, who was king of Aram, and the son of Romalia, Pekah, king of uh, Israel. Therefore, the Lord is about to bring against them the mighty floodwaters of the Euphrates. Are they going to be literally flooded in water? No, the next text goes on to tell us that they're referencing by those floodwaters the king of Assyria with all of his pomp. It will overflow all its channels, run over all its banks, sweep on into Judah, swirling over it, passing through it and reaching up to the neck. Its outspread wings will cover the breadth of your land. Emmanuel, God is with us. And finally on this score, let's go to Jeremiah. Just keep going to the right. Jeremiah chapter 46. And let's, let's look please at verses 7 and 8 of Jeremiah 46. Jeremiah 46, page 692, verses 7 and 8. Jeremiah says, Who is this that rises like the Nile, like rivers of surging waters? 
Egypt rises like the Nile, like rivers of surging waters. She says, I will rise and cover the earth. I will destroy cities and their people. And so you get this imagery of turmoil, tumult among the nations, represented by the tumult and the pounding of the waves. But ah, notice, in spite of all that, let's go back to Psalm 93, verses 3 and 4, with that powerful picture in mind of the might of turmoil, turmoil or tumult of the nations, verses 3 and 4. The seas have lifted up, Lord. Picture Hamas and Israel. The seas have lifted up their voice. Picture Russia and Ukraine. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves. Think of the nuclear arsenal of North Korea, China uh, with its uh, Belt and Road Initiative. You can just put all this together from the headlines. In spite of it all, verse 4 goes on to say, mightier than the thunder of the great waters, mightier than the breakers of the sea, the Lord, Yahweh, on high is mighty. Friends, think of it. Put it all together. All of the turmoil and the tumult that is going on literally around the world. Add to that the hurts and the heartaches and the trials and the tribulations and the sorrows and the sufferings of your life and mine. Put it all together. It is a mighty raging ocean. But the Lord is mightier. But the Lord is mightier. But the Lord is mightier. Glory be to God. One commentator put it this way. Listen carefully, please. I love this quote. He says, The great doctrine of the divine government of the world, meaning God's in charge, the great doctrine of the divine government of the world is the pillar of hope that stands firm when all around us is falling to pieces. And I'm going to read that again. The great doctrine of the divine government over the world is the pillar of hope that stands firm when all around us is falling to pieces. All glory be to God. Some of you are writing that down. I'm going to say it one more time. The great doctrine of the divine government over the world is the pillar of hope that stands firm when all around us is falling to pieces. And friends, that is powerfully portrayed, by the way, in Psalm 2. Let's go, let's go to Psalm 2 together. Uh, just turn back to the left with me, please, to Psalm 2. Uh, just a few months ago, our brother Nick Costanzo a member of the church, many of us know, student at Reformed Theological Seminary in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, preached on this psalm. It was a powerful message, Psalm 2, page 463. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. So picture the nations of the world that are persecuting Christians today, Nigeria and many other places. They're shaking their fist in the face of God. They're trying to, to destroy His people. Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. Verse 4, the one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in His anger and terrifies them in His wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Verse 10. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate His rule with trembling. Kiss His Son, or He will be angry, and your way will lead to your destruction. For His wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. You know, uh, when I was in high school, don't lose your place, by the way, in Psalm 2. When I was in high school, uh, I was involved in campus life, uh, Youth for Christ campus life. And many of the young people involved in uh, Youth for Christ campus life were not Christians. And I think I shared previously, sharing my testimony, I had never been exposed to so much sin and rebellion in my life. I was growing up in a Christian family, Christian school, etc. But I was exposed to all that. And in one particular meeting, there was probably 50 to 75 high schoolers from Wayne Valley and Wayne Hills um, in this meeting. And uh, the director at that time was Ron Hutchcraft, who, who married us, actually. And Ron was speaking to these young people, just sharing the gospel with them. And he could see on their faces that many of them were not listening. Uh, they didn't care. <laughs> they were, the last thing they were interested in was hearing the gospel. And, and Ron made the point that metaphorically, he said, I know that many of you young people are, in effect, shaking your fist in the face of Almighty God. And he said, even as we're sitting here today, and I'm sharing this with you, he said, in your heart and in your mind, you are looking up at God and you're saying, I don't need you. I don't want you. I don't care. Leave me alone. I'll do it my way. 
And I will never forget as a young teenager that many years ago what Ron said. He said three words, not very smart, not very smart. And that's true. Going back earlier in the days of my youth, which is even many more years ago, boys and girls, we used to sing another Sunday school song, and it kind of pulls all this together. And the song goes like this. This is my father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my father's world. Why should my heart be sad? The Lord is king. Let the heavens ring. God reigns. Let the earth be glad. Glory be to God. Those words are so true. So, brothers and sisters, amidst all of the trials and tribulations of our lives, amidst all of the tumult of the nations and the pounding of the waves, you and I as God's people ought to be comforted, grow in confidence, and in good courage because of the character of the Lord's reign, the character of the Lord's reign. Well, let's go back one last time, and I apologize all too briefly to Psalm 93 together. The third and final reason of which our text speaks in Psalm 93 regarding the Lord's reign and why we should be comforted. And that reason concerns the constancy of His reign, the constancy of His reign. Now, brothers and sisters, that was hinted at already in verse 2, where it says, Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. But let's pick it up in verse 5, the constancy of His reign. It says, Your statutes, Lord. Now, notice, it's not your statues, boys and girls, like pigeons sit on. It's statutes with another, another T in the word. And statutes has been defined as a being a reference to God's laws, as His divine testimonies concerning what God requires of us. Uh, the late Dr. James Montgomery Boyce, who used, was long-term pastor down at 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, he comments on statutes this way. He said, God rules His people by His Word. He rules His people by His Word. And says another, God's testimonies are His commandments, considered as a witness to man of His nature and of His will, respecting them. Indeed, in John 14, verse 15, our Lord Jesus says to His disciples, If you love Me, then obey what I command. If you love Me, then obey what I command. So friends, we can check up on ourselves spiritually to see how much we love Jesus. And it's related to whether or not we obey His commands. Jesus said it Himself in John 14, 15, If you love Me, you will obey what I command. Well, let's look at verse 5 again of Psalm 93. Your statutes, Lord, stand firm. They are very sure. They are fully confirmed, some of the translations say. Your statutes, Lord, stand firm. Isaiah 40, verse 8 declares, The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. The word of our God stands forever. Your statutes, Lord, stand firm. Holiness adorns your house for endless days, for endless days. One commentator has said, Sacred and inviolable is the word of our King. Sacred and inviolable should be the loyalty of His subjects. Matthew Henry puts it this way concerning the holiness that adorns His house for endless days. Matthew Henry says, fashions change. Ladies, you probably wouldn't wear today what you wore 30 years ago. Maybe you wait long enough, it comes back. I don't know. But Matthew Henry says, fashions change. And what is becoming at one time is not at another. But holiness always becomes God's house and family and those who belong to it. It is perpetually decent, and nothing so ill becomes the worshipers of God as unholiness. End of quote. Now, think about that. Think about that. Holiness adorns your house. Several years ago, when I was still serving at Pompton Plains Reformed Bible Church in New Jersey, young family, like this, they walked in cold one day. Just, I hadn't seen them before. They walk into church, and after the service, we're in coffee, I go up to the father and I introduce myself and want to know who they were, where they were from, and so on. So I want to be careful how I say this. He named the church that they had just come from. And if I said the name, all the people from New Jersey know exactly where it is and probably some of the Pennsylvania people too. You would know the church. Huge Baptist church. So he said, that's where we came from. So I said, well, what brings you here today? Here's what he told me. His name was Bob. He said, uh, I, was, I was an usher at said church for quite some time. And he said, as time was going on, he said, I started noticing what I'm calling 
disquiet. I think that was the word he used. I'm calling it disquiet. And he said, as time was going on, he said, the way that people were dressing and they're during the service, they're going to the coffee bar and they're getting food to eat. This is during the service, he's saying. And he's saying there was just more and more noise and I'm trying to concentrate on the message. And he said, to be honest with you, Reverend, he said, I finally felt, this was his quote, he said, I finally felt like I was ushering at a, at a, at a Yankee game instead of at a worship service. He said it was just like chaos. And then he said, what put me over the edge, he said, last week, as an usher, I was there early, and he said the praise band was rehearsing. And he said, as I was getting things ready, and some of you are going to know, know the name, he said they started playing Led Zeppelin. He said, before I was a Christian, Led Zeppelin was my favorite rock band. There, it's an English rock band. Some of you maybe never heard of it. He said, <laughs> he said, they started playing Led Zeppelin in the sanctuary of the Lord's house. And he said, that put me over the edge. And he said, I walked out. And he said, I'm not going back. Now, friends, sadly, what I'll call the Yankee Stadium aura is infiltrating and infecting many, many, many an evangelical church in our country today. And it's serious business. It is really serious business. In fact, one of the texts that confirmed that to us, it's in the New Testament. It's in Hebrews chapter 12. If you want to turn, it's page 1042. Otherwise, you can just listen. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 28 and 29. It says this, Hebrews 12, 28 and 29. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Our God is a consuming fire. And if you're taking notes, jot down Hebrews 10.31, which says it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, as we seek by God's grace to serve and worship Him in holiness and in humility, let us rejoice in the fact that our God reigns and also in the constancy of that reign, the constancy of that reign. Well, the kids are getting restless, so why don't we go to Mark chapter 4 as we close, as, as we close. You know, we are so blessed with all these young children. I'm telling you, you know, sometimes the parents will come up to me after a service and go, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm telling you, we praise God for these children. They are covenant children. The Bible refers to them as lambs of the flock, lambs of the flock. And for some reason, I can just block it all out. I am oblivious to it most of the time. Let's go to Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 4. Drop down with me, please, brothers and sisters, to verse 35, page 861 in the Maroon Bible. One of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. And with this, we're going to close. Mark 4, 35. That day when evening came, he, that is Jesus, said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. The other side of what? It's the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Margaret and I had the privilege of being in, in Israel. Don't close your text. Uh, about 2018, roughly. I'm telling you, friends, the Sea of Galilee was the highlight of that trip for me. I have never seen or been at such a serene place in my entire life. You can feel the serenity, not just see it, you can feel it on the Sea of Galilee. That's where they were. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, Jesus along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall notice came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Boys and girls, they thought they were going to drown. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? They were petrified. He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, imperative. Some of the translations say, Peace, be still. Quiet, peace, be still. Be still is in the middle voice in the Greek. I had a Greek professor that pointed out to us that when, the middle voice means it's an action you take for, upon yourself. And the Greek professor said, Jesus said to the wind and the waves, quiet, muzzle yourself. Quiet, muzzle yourself. And notice what happened. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. Do you ever notice if you're on the water when the storm stops, it isn't completely calm. The waves are still sloshing until eventually they get smaller and then it stops. 
When Jesus said, peace, be still, there was instantly a great calm. Think of that. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And brothers and sisters, maybe Jesus is saying that to you today by his word and spirit. Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? My dear friend, if you are fearful today, if you're afraid because of the tumult, the winds and the waves in your own heart and life, I say this lovingly and respectfully, maybe you have a reason to be afraid. Listen to what I'm saying. You are not in a relationship with the God who created you through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. And from your perspective, my dear friend, everything is spinning out of control and you are a tiny pawn in the game of life. If that's you, and you're legitimately afraid, I would ask you and I would urge you, I would pray and I would plead with you in this very hour, repent of your sins and profess faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior because He alone will be able to say to your heart and mind and soul, peace, be still, and it will be a great calm. And oh, my dear brothers and sisters in the Lord, When you and I consider the tumult of the nations and all of the hurts and heartaches and sorrows and sufferings of our own personal lives, let us today draw comfort and courage and confidence from the fact that we've looked at the words of the psalmist and we are going to rest and rejoice in the reality that the Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. Amen. Let's bow our heads and our hearts together in prayer. O Lord, our God, in the words of the sacred songwriter, we say and we pray, Come, Thou Almighty King. Help us Thy name to sing. Help us to praise. Father, all-glorious or all-victorious, come and reign over us. Ancient of days. Hear us, Lord, we pray. By your grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, unto the forgiveness of our sins, the peace of our hearts and minds, and unto the comfort and salvation of our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.